everyone. Welcome. We all know each other, but my name is Paige and I'm at the Shoots Public Library and we're here for a great, wonderful, fantastic workshop with, hosted by Central Oregon Writers Guild. You know, first of all, uh, is there anybody here who's got some great news or wants to share anything? Anybody get published or rejected this week? I got uh, one of those happened to me. No, I know that. Yeah. Um, go ahead. It looks like Sarah did. Did you get published or rejected? Which one? I got rejected and it was the nicest, most thoughtful and affirming rejection I've ever received. So I'm feeling really good. And um, it was from Hippocampus. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, creative nonfiction journal. And so now I'm talking them up so much because they gave real feedback that oh, actually good. I had come to myself that I thought, gosh, this needs to be a longer piece. I submitted a flash piece and a couple months ago, I just said, I think it's, I think it's gonna be longer than this. And that was part of their feedback. So I just really applaud journal editors that actually give you real feedback. So hit yeah, the yeah, great. <laughs> Anybody else some news? Rebecca, how's the book going? Are you asking me? Yeah. Which book are we talking about? <laughs> the one that I just, the one that just came out? Yeah. What do you mean, how's it going? Well, I mean, you know, is, is Oprah calling or what's going on? Uh, my friends and family are excited for me and probably bought five or so copies off of Amazon. All right. So I'm thrilled about it. You're rolling. <laughs> you are a professional author now, right? Professional. Um, speaking of which, and Rebecca, uh, remind me or send me an email or something to remind me, but it, we do post um, member publications on our website. So if you've got something out there, email me and I'll, and I'll make sure that we get it onto the website there too. Um, I do want to mention Oliver Brennan is a new member here. He's just joining us. And Oliver is a crime writer. He's going to be doing a class up at COCC in the coming year. Um, but Oliver was talking about getting a, a crime writers group together. So if anyone's interested in that, um, just go ahead and put, uh, you can uh, chat directly with o Oliver um or just put your information in the chat and we'll and we'll uh get you all together on that yeah anyone crime minded let me know yeah or if you just want to commit crimes or learn how to commit crimes better um yeah then... i mean let's not talk about that where it can be traced but yeah okay. i can help figure that out wonderful okay um so then without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mary Krakow. Mary Krakow is our featured reader coordinator and has done a fantastic job of getting um, our featured readers in for our monthly meetings and for our December uh, uh, member reading. And um, is just a wonderful person in general. So there's Mary. And Mary, I'll let you introduce our featured reader tonight. Okay, uh, before I introduce our featured reader for tonight, I do want to make a plug for the December holiday reading. It's going to be what date? Oh, I don't even have the date written down. Is it the 14th? Anyway, it'll be in December. I see the heads nodding. December 14th. And I, I do have six slots filled. I'm so excited. I got five first time readers to sign up, which was my goal. But I, I need to have uh, at least four more readers. They could be first time readers, they could be return readers. It could be whatever. Um, so if you're interested, please put something in the chat and I will sign you up. Okay, that's my plug for December. All right, so now on to tonight's featured reader. Andrew J. Smiley is a native of Maine who currently lives in Madras with his wife, three children, and a clan of mostly good-natured house spiders. He has been trying unsuccessfully to rewrite The Lord of the Rings since he had an epiphany in eighth grade. A sometime poet, full-time gamer, and meme ninja, he has served as a middle school English language arts teacher for the last 12 years. 
One of his most fulfilling accomplishments was being a chaperone for a sister city student exchange to Nagano, Japan. His interests trend toward the arcane and offbeat, and his current project is a light fantasy novel series influenced by Paradise Lost and The Inferno. The first book was completed over the summer. So please welcome Andrew J. Smiley. Yeah, I should probably unmute. Okay, cool. Thank you. I didn't really realize how ridiculous it sounded until someone else read it, but oh well, got to start somewhere. So, <laughs> so thanks for uh, thanks for introducing me, Mary. I'm going to be reading a piece of the novel and I just kind of want to preface it by saying uh, thanks in advance for listening. And also I was able to finish a lifelong ambition over the summer, which was to start and finish a novel. And I'm like, holy cow, I did it. So I'll be reading the uh, little epigraph part, which kind of opens the window on the world. And then just chapter two. Don't ask me why not one. I just felt like two is a better read. So, all right, here we go. <clears throat> epigraph. There are places that we can see and places that only the heart remembers. Realms of light and dark. Visions that we have known and felt but forgotten. The world of mankind has a hidden side, a secret sister. Her name is Eden, and our stories are told upon her trees. She is the source of our dreams, the foundation of our fears, the muse of our mythology and our magic. Eden is the home our hearts long for, the paradise remembered by our souls and fought for by our faith. There may be times, by happy accident or by grim design, that the veil separating the sisters grows thin Natural becomes supernatural, light and darkness meet, and angels descend to protect the way forward. Chapter 2, The Player, subtitled Peregrine. Time was the enemy. He was always the enemy, breaking all speed limits when things were going well, then grinding its gears when a restless student is stuck in their least favorite class. Peregrine Nevitt slouched back in his integrated desk chair, fighting back the urge to yawn loudly as the English three instructor kept plowing through an agonizing PowerPoint on the prominent poets of the 19th century. This was a cruel parody of education. Only a handful of students were engaged by any definition. The rest were cowed into a submissive stupor from the looming threat of Mrs. Schultz's quick temper and notoriously severe reprimands. You know, if they put these guys on trading cards with stats and achievements, I might actually be able to remember some of this crap. It was a struggle to keep his vision from blurring as the instructor flicked to another slide of a sour looking intellectual displaying a savage swath of beard. He was already on his last verbal warning and it was only 15 minutes into class. He hit strike two just a minute ago by pulling in a Walt Whitman quote he'd seen in a YouTube commercial yesterday. So much for offering the olive branch. He had consigned himself to a stubborn silence instead, trying not to nod off and repeat last week's unfortunate nodding off, lurching awake, falling out of chair bit that had gotten him some scattered applause and a disciplinary referral. I thought junior year was supposed to be this nirvana of cake classes and intramurals, he grumbled, propping his feet against the parcel shelf under the desk in front of him and contemplating the patterns of the stains on the aging drop tiles, drop ceiling tiles. Peregrine who never answered to anything but Perry out of pure disdain for the birth parent who that had named him after a bird was a young man of average height and build and above average libido for his age. He wore what he did on most weekdays, Fairchild senior high school athletic tee and track pants and a windbreaker in the livery of the school colors, white trimmed in red, blue and gold banding. A dusting of fine stubble along his jaw and chin gave his face a bit of character, and he liked to keep his hair made up in the not-styled shag favored by male K-pop idols, since most of the girls he knew thought of it as hot. He didn't go out of his way to get into trouble, but he wasn't afraid of it either, since it seemed to find him often enough. He said what he felt, and has often strained his social circumstances where authority figures were involved. He tended toward a natural restlessness, an urge to wander, to explore and keep moving forward. Right now, though, he had the urge to be anywhere else on the planet. And so, without the influence of the fireside poets, our catalog of wonderful modern literature would never have found the form it has grown into today. Mrs. Schultz's grand dry erase flourish seemed intended for applause to break out in the classroom. He sighed. She has no idea that the modern American literature has actually evolved into the internet meme. 
He kept from tipping into the numbing void of apathy by reassuring himself about cross-country practice, which took the place of his seventh period study hall and alternating school days. Just the thought of being able to jog down the FCHS track, the wind in his hair, running just fast enough to keep pace behind the long legs and tight shorts of Amber and Dini. You'll be reading a short biopic of Meyer Hervin Melville over the weekend, and I want all of you to pay special attention to... The teacher's reedy voice rose an octave as she rallied for another sweeping admonition. How can someone be so lame and still be so intense about it? He thought. She'd even come dressed up as Minerva McGonagall during Spirit Week in some effort to be relevant. Peregrine's glanced slyly across the row. Maybe he could catch Lena's attention. The brunette was dangerously cute, cradling a vague look on her face as she slowly worked on a bit of gum. He appraised the line of her thigh in her black yoga pants and moved up, considering her pleasant measurements in various states of undress, as Mrs. Schultz droned on about the holy writ of her academic saints. Do you risk making a move for his Powerade? Maybe palm a bit of beef jerky from the snack cache in the side pocket of the duffel slung across the back of his chair? This was ridiculous. How long could a self-respecting 17-year-old varsity runner allow himself to be mentally held hostage by an owl in a shawl and a pencil skirt? Please deliver me from this purgatory. A second later, he jumped as he felt his phone vibrate against his leg. Grateful he'd remembered to turn on stealth mode after chemistry lab, Peregrine waited until Mrs. Schultze was writing some key points on the whiteboard in her evil spidery script, then wormed the phone out of his pocket. He made sure line of sight was secure before he checked his notifications under the cover of his desk. You gotta be kidding. Ask and ye shall receive. Peregrine eased the phone back into his pocket, snarling silently at the geeky kid two rows over who had seen everything and was giving him the side eye looking close to blowing the whistle. He glanced back up at the clock, pushing his ACHS athletics hat back, restlessly rubbing his scalp as he tried to decide on the best move, grit teeth and suffer out the period, or risk the wrath of the dragon lady for a bathroom break to just ditch here and now. He scratched his jaw, eyeing the sulky kid's hunched shoulders again. Ugh, decisions, decisions. It wasn't the first time he'd wished he's kept his big mouth shut. The end. Well, chapter two. Nice job. That was great. That was a, um, I love the voice in there. And I'm looking forward to the 19th century poet playing cards or um, trading cards, I guess. Yeah, I wish I could take credit for that. My sister gave me that idea. I was like, you know what? I'm using it. Yeah. Um, I don't think any of us should be embarrassed about stealing stuff from uh, other people. That's uh, that's stock and trade for writers, right? All right, here comes Sarah Sear. Sarah's work has appeared in Newsweek, the Boston Globe, Boston Magazine, Cosmopolitan, Art News, and Brevity. She began a daily writing practice in uh, 2014 after reading Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones. Since then, she studied extensively with Natalie, including a year-long writing intensive at the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe. Sarah hosts writing workshops that braid mindfulness with generative writing, and if you get on her mailing list, she'll send you some very thoughtful writing prompts on the first of every month. You can see samples of her work and find out more about Sarah and her workshops at www.sarahseer.com, and I'm putting that in the chat. and. Here's Sarah. Thank you, Mike. I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you, Mike and Paige and everyone, everyone here, all the members of the Guild for inviting me. Um, I know some of you, and so it's nice to see some of you uh, that I know and also to see some of you that I do not know. Um, and so for tonight, Mike, when do you want me to stop and have time for questions, just so I have a sense? So we, um, I'll, I'll let you sort of figure that out. I mean, if we have 10 or 15 minutes of, for questions, that's great. We try and wrap up by seven o'clock. So you've got an hour and 10 minutes here to, to play with, oh, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, 
right, so my goal for tonight is for all of you to leave with some clay to work with. Uh, clay meaning a mound of words for you to need and work into whatever you might be working on, whether that's a short story or a novel or a memoir, an essay, or, and especially a novel if you're participating in NaNoWriMo this month. Or if you aren't actively working on something, then tonight we're going to be working out some writing muscles uh, via some exercises, nice Oliver, uh, that you can carry with you and repeat over and over again. And um, so sticking with that writing muscle memoir or memoir, hmm, that would be an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an interesting read. Um, the writing muscle metaphor. Uh, let's stretch out a bit, shall we? Uh, I really want us to get warmed up. So if we were runners, maybe we'd be stretching our quads or our calves. Uh, but as writers, we'll get our hands stretched out and our minds stretched out. And we're going to begin with an exercise accessing first thoughts. And first thoughts, what is this term? It's, it's really about trusting your gut and listening to the first image that comes to mind, um, the first thing that comes to mind. So often we, we work in the realm of second or third or fourth thoughts. So in life and in writing. So if we're writing something, maybe we're um, at the keyboard and we're writing something and we write a phrase or a sentence and then the editor pops up and we begin to self edit right away within that, that paragraph that you're working on. And so you might be thinking that editor might be saying, that's not literary enough or that's not, um, my aunt Tilda won't want to read that or my mom does not want to read that I need to change that. Uh, I'm going to go with something else and you change it and. Um, it's not so much about that that one edit that you're working on, but it's it's the realm that you're in of of being the editor so for this exercise and then the other exercises that we're going to be doing. The territory we're going to work in is um, the shitty first draft territory. So this is a term that I'm borrowing from Anne Lamont, uh, her book Bird by Bird, which I highly recommend. And the first draft, meaning don't worry about spelling, don't worry about grammar, lose control. Say what you want to say, not what you think you should say. So trust the first thing that comes to mind. Imagine that your editor is duct tape in the back seat of the car and the creator is at the wheel. Okay. And I was thinking today, I've, I really like that image so much. I'm going to hire an illustrator to <laughs> illustrate an image of the creator at the wheel and the editor with a, with their mouth duct tape. So if I do that and I, I just hire someone just for fun, I will send that out to the guild. Okay. Um, all right. So so keep that image in mind. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. Grab your notebooks and this is just fun stuff. We're going to, I'll give a word or a phrase, and then you write down the first phrase, word, or, or a phrase or word that symbolizes a story um, that comes into your head. So first thoughts. So for example, if I said the word pigeon, you would, I would start writing, okay, pigeon, pigeon, Osa, my, I wouldn't write this, but it, that is my Swedish roommate who I lived with in London and she was deathly afraid of pigeons and they were always on our patio. So I would write Osa, 
Venice, gray and pink, yada, 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 yada. Just free writing. They can be lists or you can start the story that immediately comes to mind. It's totally up to you. This is just to get warmed up. Um, first drafts. Okay. Sound good? And Janine and Kathy, I know you've done some version of this, but I promise there are different terms. So this is something that you haven't done before. I know you were like, wait a minute. She talked about that pigeon before. So um, yeah, don't worry. This is all fresh. Um, beginner's mind. Here we go. All right. The word and just so you know, you'll have about a minute for each of these. So short. Sprints right out of the gate, first thoughts. Road trip, road trip. Okay, wind down. Next one. Apple pie. Okay, wind down. Jacket. Okay, next one. Last one. Second grade.
Okay, wind down. Okay, we're warm. We're a bit more warm than maybe five or six minutes ago. And I want to invite everyone who doesn't have the, they don't have their video on, if you can turn it on, obviously, if, if you are doing something that prevents you to, but I think that it does create a sense of, of really being here. So if that is an option, um, I'd invite you to, to turn your video on. So sprints, sprints. It's good to, it's good to change up your writing practice, right? Um, so often, perhaps you sit down and you work on some prose and you have a concentrated block of time and you're working maybe on word count or pages or something like that. But uh, especially those days where you're feeling a bit foggy um, or distracted, doing some sprints right before, it's just some, something to have in the back of your pocket, your, your back pocket, just, okay, sprints. And um, sometimes I will just look around the room or look outside or pull open a book and just grab five words uh, that come to mind and, and then use those as the beginning of sprints. And they can be great just warming up and also they can be really good at little seeds maybe over the course of the sprints that we did accessing first thoughts you might look over your list and maybe find something that oh i'm actually gonna work with that at some point and um you can put that in the back of your notebook or however you organize your writing life a, a word document or there's so many different ways, um, just as a as an exercise or as a prompt for a writing moment. Um, so I'm wondering, does anyone feel like sharing what they wrote in response to those sprints? I could say the the word and then you could share what what you wrote. And I know it's putting you on the spot, but if you're feeling up for it. Can just wave. Sue. Great, thank you. Um, my dad had a saying about apple pie that he said every time my mom baked an apple pie, he used to say, apple pie without the cheese is like a kiss without the squeeze. And every time I have apple pie. Most people serve it with ice cream, but my dad liked it with a hunk of cheddar cheese. Wow. And when I heard that, that was the immediate thing that popped into my mind was a memory of my dad. Mm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> I have to try that out. And food, I will say this over and over again, food is such a great entry point into something much larger, right? You could just go off from there. You can begin with the anecdote, the story, the image of what your dad said about apple pie. You could fill it in with some color of what Thanksgiving looked like or whenever you ate apple pie as a, a ritual possibly and fill it in with some color and then just go off on something something as an entry point into your relationship with your dad. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else, either a small nugget or, or the whole list, Rebecca? Because she just shared about her dad, I was going to share about my dad because <laughs> I wrote one too. The road trip one, uh, we, we used to take summer vacations as an adult, myself an adult, my and my children and my dad would go on these trips. So traveling with my dad, 
throwing away the video. He, we stopped at a blockbuster and he threw it in the trash instead of the return bin. It was just hilarious. And, um, being the side, side seat driver and he was in charge of all the triptychs from AAA. That was kind of his job to try and keep him occupied and going through toll booths. And he would always yell at me that I'm in the wrong line. The other one's moving faster. And if I moved over, then he said, now you're on that one's moving faster. And he would just yell at me. This is a fond memory, really. <laughs> and, uh, um, just my children laughing in the back seat, trying not to be heard by him because they just thought it was hilarious. It's a very fond memory. So, <laughs> hi, this is Linda. Hi. So, uh, I'll share my apple pie thought. Um, my son will never forget or let me forget the time I tried to make an apple pie. He doesn't remember or claims not to remember all the wonderful meals I've cooked over the years. Just the damned apple pie that turned out like black goo <laughs> and is the last one I ever tried to make. Did it taste good? No. No, it looked great in the trash though. <laughs> I don't care. It's, as long as it tastes good, I don't care how it looks. <laughs> no, it was looked too nasty to even try. Thank you, Linda. Judy and then Andrew. Judy, you're muted. Oops. Uh, the one that actually caught my attention the most was the pigeon. <laughs> oh. And so even though I wrote up the other ones, I took a little moment to write about that one. A man sitting on a San Francisco park, park branch tossed torn thread pieces from a brown paper lunch bag. Pigeons drew near, peck, pecking at the bread chunks. Suddenly he grabbed the bird and shoved it into the bag. The bird poked its head out. The man pushed it back in and walked away. Nice. Thank you. Andrew? That was unexpectedly dark and cool. <clears throat> uh, I did the one with the jacket. She told me she slept in the jacket I let her borrow that day when it rained us out at the carnival. It became my favorite jacket. I still have it. Mm. Jackets, yeah, wearing someone else's jacket. Ooh, there's a lot there. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's someone wearing yours. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Wow, this is a really great group because I was expecting sometimes it's pulling teeth. So I really appreciate you. <laughs> um, great. <clears throat> All right, so where we're going tonight is the title of the workshop is Writing as a Visual Art. And in the description for tonight, I had said we're going to be writing people, places, and events. And I was laughing at myself when I was preparing for this. Um, good Lord, I was very ambitious. And so we are going to really be saturated with writing about people. Uh, I thought that would be what we would focus on. Really word sketching is what we're going to do tonight and um, blowing life into the people that we are writing or we're thinking about or want and desire to write about. So that could be a character from a piece of fiction that you're working on. It could be a person in the memoir or essay or um, that you're working on. And um, we're going to do some exercises to bring them more to life, to sketch them out. And as Mike had said, my teacher and mentor is Natalie Goldberg. And one of the mantras I've heard her say over and over again is writing is 90% listening. And over time, I've adjusted that word to be writing is 90% noticing. 
and we're writers 100% of the time, even when we're not working with pen and paper or, or the keyboard. And um, we're writers outside of that time by noticing, noticing the way when you're reading, for example, if you were reading a memoir and suddenly halfway through, it shifts into second person point of view and, and you're startled awake. And it's, it's now you, you, you. So you're noticing what that does to you as a reader. Or this time of, of year is a beautiful time to notice the light outside, the quality of the light, mellow, soft, through the clouds. I've probably seen more rainbows in my life <laughs> this last few weeks than I, I've never seen so many rainbows. So gosh, wow, I noticed in our region, October and now November is a season of rainbows. So noticing, noticing what's going on around you. Uh, noticing, Andrew, I think you've done a lot of noticing in your teaching because that comes straight through in your writing, you're incorporating your noticings of of your teaching into your writing and um so noticing what your students your children your parents your boss your friend a stranger who you walk by noticing what they say and jotting that down in your notebook and um, writing is really about being aware and noticing. And um, tonight we're going to bring our noticings to the page using some exercises. And so let's start with um, just for a moment. Think about someone you're writing into or someone you want to write about and um, like I was saying, a character in a novel, your aunt, even yourself, if you're writing a memoir, you could do this exercise um, about yourself and take some time to maybe jot a few people down, think about who you might want to focus on tonight. And, and then we'll continue. Okay, so figure out which one you are interested in, what piques your curiosity, and here we are, go with your first thought, even if it's, you know, your logical thought might be, oh, I really need to, I, I know who I want to write about, but for some reason, this other person is popping up, go with that, because this is, as I said, we're just, we're just forming clay. And this is an exercise you can repeat over and over again. Okay. All right, I'm excited. <laughs> so we are going to do another series of sprints. And um, just like we did, I will say a prompt and you'll apply that prompt to this person. And we're just sketching, we're sketching. 
and um, accessing first thoughts, whatever comes to mind. And um, if you can keep your pen moving the whole time, and this will be about, I'll give about one to two minutes, depending on the, the phrase for each. Okay, here we go. Their hair. Hair. Okay, next one, their skin. Okay. What are they wearing? What clothes, what jewelry, shoes? What are they wearing?
Okay, moving on. How do they move? What is this person's gait like? What gestures? Here's another angle to the last one. What does this person do with their hands? Okay, a few more. And if you're really into something, just go for it. <clears throat> you can just ignore the whatever I'm saying, just go for it. Um, what does this person smell like? Smell.
What is their favorite book, TV show, radio, or podcast, or movie? Be specific. Book, TV show, radio, podcast, movie. Okay, last one. What idiosyncratic behaviors or traits are specific to this person? Okay, start to wind down. <clears throat> All right, so I'd love, I'm gonna open up some breakout rooms and we'll just pair up uh, in, it, we'll see how the numbers go but we'll pair up in twos. And if you'd like to share your whole sketch with that other person um, and how that can look is one person goes first and you can just read the whole, the whole piece that you just wrote, the clay. And, um, and then the next person can go and let's practice no comment tonight. So when someone reads, um, so no comment on what you're reading 
and also no comment on what someone else is reading. So if I was going to read uh, my sketch, I would begin without any intro real introduction. If you want to say I'm working on a crime novel and this is the main character, sure. But uh, let's refrain from this was just I'm just so tired tonight. This is not my best work. Just just um, read aloud your words. And then afterwards, the person that you're paired up with, there's no need to really comment. Um, just listen deeply. And and then the next person uh, take their turn and read. OK. And so we'll take a few minutes to do that and then come back to the big room and we'll continue. Okay. So let's see here. Thank and I'm wondering if the people who aren't, let's see here. I'm wondering if the people who are not on video, whether they want to be in a breakout room or not? I think a few people just dropped out who probably didn't want to be in breakout rooms. OK. Um, they could obviously, I can finagle it. So if you want to stay but not be in a breakout room and just um, hang out until we come back, that is a possibility. So I will, um, I'll open it up and then we'll just see how things filter out. And if I need to do some moving around, um, we can do that. So, so here we go. So just open them and so if you can enter them. Oh, no, I didn't, I apologize. My wand was not working. <clears throat> Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Um, Janet says she's having technical difficulties, so she cannot join a breakout room, but that looks like she's alone in hers. So that that yeah. works fine. Yeah. Great. And then Rosemary, did you want to join a breakout room or? Oh, could you unmute yourself? It takes me a minute sometimes too. Oh, I think you're unmuted. Oh, she's she entered room number two. Okay, great. Okay. So they might take a minute, but um, mm -hmm. that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, and Candace and Kathy are together and they know each other. Nice. Who did you write about? Uh, myself. All oh. the, yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's weird, but yeah, <laughs> was it? Was it? Oh, yeah. Revealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who did you write about, Sarah? 
I am writing about Natalie right now. Um, and mm -hmm. so it was interesting. I, I wrote about her, I sketched her out and I realized in part that I, um, haven't noticed some things that I probably could or should have. Right. I think I've noticed like, oh, maybe I don't really notice as much. Um, I mean, of course I do. There are things that I notice, but, um, there are things that maybe would be interesting to, to notice about her that I haven't, or I haven't yet been able to nail down how to write about her. So, mm -hmm. Would you like to share any of them? Yeah, well, let's do a little bit. Um, yeah, hair. Oh, actually I'm recording. Hmm. Um, yeah, let's pause it. Good. Well, um, how was that sharing? Wonderful. Exercise, good. Yeah. Yeah. Had some feedback from, from others who came earlier. So, full disclosure, though, um, we were like definitely giving each other feedback and commentary. <laughs> breaking the rules, breaking the rules. Hey, <clears throat> can't say I have not done that. It's funny. I always end up breaking my own rules. So there you go. Um, okay, good. good. Um, Question, what was the point of not giving feedback? I mean, I um, think the amount of time that was provided was more than ample for everything that we could have written in the time that you provided and given feedback. So oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it was partly a function of time. And also, I think that when we're in this space of creation, right, with the editor duct tape, um, it's really nice to stay in that space. So when you're sharing these shitty first drafts, um, it, fresh off the press, it might not be the time that you want to receive feedback um, or, or yeah. So um, okay. that, that's a lot of thinking too. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm gonna wrap things up with just a few words and then we will have time for questions and discussion just to honor the time. We have about 10 more minutes. So, um, so yeah, tonight that exercise was really uh, working on the adage that many of you, probably everyone has heard, show, don't tell in writing, show. And um, so, uh, for example, moving away from saying something really general when you're writing, like, a cashier was kind to me, right? That's that's summarizing what this person was like. And we want to be moving towards sketching the actions, uh, the gestures that show how the cashier was kind. So, um, for example, the cashier's eyes creased to the sides when she smiled at me, or she winked when handing me the change. And so using these sketches, we can be working on how to show what we want to show about the people that we're writing about instead of generically telling about these people. And the sketch that you did, you're not going to include every single last detail that you wrote down tonight. Um, this is the clay, right? And so it is your choice as an artist when you're writing, um, you have these details near, uh, maybe you have the sketch uh, posted up somewhere or off to the side as you're writing. Maybe you've highlighted with a yellow highlighter or in some other way bolded what really matters for this person that you would definitely want to include. And as you're writing, you might pull a few of these details in. Um, maybe, and maybe it's when you're introducing a character, 
you're not including every single detail in the first description of this person. Maybe you include one or two, like what their hair looks like or their gait, whatever is relevant to what you're writing, the scene that you're writing. And, and then maybe sprinkle in more details later on, what they're reading, what's on their bedside table, they're, they're drinking a cup of tea and what are they reading at their dining room table in the morning. Um, and so these specific details, for example, of what someone, their favorite TV show, they're telling, they're showing your readers a lot about your character, right? What someone wears, very particular. And it tells you a lot about that person. Um, what they eat, we didn't get into what they eat. That could, that could be another angle. What are they eating? What are they drinking? What are they um, consuming? Um, so all of these details bring more dimension, depth, which makes a more satisfactory experience for your reader and hopefully in the writing process for you too. Maybe you thought of something by, God, what do they do with their hands? I would have never thought to include that. Oh, that's interesting. So, um, this is a great exercise to have at hand, like I was saying, especially days where you're feeling a little rusty and, um, but you've blocked out an hour of writing time or what, however you've blocked out your writing time and you wanna feel a sense of productivity and movement. Okay, I'm gonna sketch out all of the characters. Or I'm gonna sketch two characters out today and be done and feel like I, I made some effort um and it's important to break your writing up in that way you know we got to keep it fun it can it can really um become drudgery if you are fighting yourself to the page every every time or not every time obviously we all wouldn't be here if that was the case but um on those days that are hard it's good to kind of give us little treats right um so this is good to have and I have other exercises um, that some of you have done for place, filling out place, um, thinking of writing as a visual act um, or a visual, visual art, how to sketch place, landscapes, rooms, buildings. Um, so if you want, if you want me to send it to you, I can, if you want, just put your email address in the chat and I can send that exercise out for you to have in your back pocket as well. And when, when I send that to you, um, how could I do this? Yeah, Mike said I also send out monthly prompts and updates on writing groups that I'm leading. So maybe in the chat, if you, if you are giving me your email address, just write prompts too, or something like that to let me know if you'd be interested in that too. And I'll, I'll grab that from the chat. Um, but we have about five minutes left for questions or comments. If anyone has anything. I'd love to hear how that was for you. Um, Cause again, I think my kids share it. This is the first time I've done that particular exercise. With the group. I, I really liked it, Sarah. And I want to thank you because um, I think I tend to rush through my characters a lot and uh, it really makes you slow down and think about all those little, like you were saying, those little details that you wouldn't maybe include normally that mm -hmm. give that person more character and more uh, personality, um, even if they're minor characters, you know, just really to fill them out. So I enjoyed it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was really great, especially for me as I'm thinking about a character now that I have to go back and um, round out, so to speak, for my uh, for my edits. And uh, I found it very helpful. So thank you very much. <laughs> and um, one thing I like to say about the um, shitty first draft and duct taping uh, the editor is that one of my favorite crime writers, Jordan Harper, calls it writing the tiger. 
And that tiger is that inner creativity of yours. And you just have to hold on and let that tiger go. Mm -hmm. Just see what happens at the end. <laughs> riding, riding the tiger. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Riding the tiger. That's the name of his blog too. He's pretty nuts, but he's a great writer. I have never heard of that. That's great. Thank you. Anybody else? Hmm. Oh, shoot. These dark nights, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good. This is partly why I did sprints. Just kind of keep the energy, keep the heat, right? <clears throat> um, on a November night, <laughs> heading towards the winter solstice. So, Sarah, um, I just wanted to say thank you. I just am not on camera because I'm unwell, and I know this is being recorded. So, gotcha. But, Thank you. The sprints were, I, I said in the breakout room um, with my partner, who was amazing, by the way, that the, the sprints and the prompts are, are useful in that um, I tend to get in my own way because I'm almost two steps ahead of myself. And so I'm, I'm not, it's, it's almost like I'm censoring myself when I'm writing. Um, because I know I'm going to go back and refine. So this type of exercise where it's like, okay, if I'm doing that, I'm going to end up with two sentences. So what's the point? Um, I, I really appreciate um, being pushed um, because it's for me, you know, out of, out of my comfort zone, but then I end up with some raw material I guess, what did you call it? The messy first draft or the disastrous that then I can go back and, and rework it. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Yeah, let's keep with messy, not disastrous, right? <laughs> messy, yep. Great, thank you. Was that Michelle or Nicole? Uh, Michelle, yes, Michelle. thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Sarah. This has yeah. been fantastic. Um, I love I love when we get to to write, and I love when we get to work with each other and and chat and do all that sort of stuff. Uh, excellent prompt and very useful. And I of course will be using this when I whenever I run into that snag of who the hell is this person I'm I'm trying to write about, right? Um, I'm going to pass it off to Paige. She's got a couple of libraries things, some cool stuff coming up um, that that uh, she's working on. And um, thank you all very much. You're all wonderful, and it's just wonderful to see you all. So thanks for coming. Yes, this is amazing, Sarah. Thank you, Central Oregon Writers Guild. Thank you. You all really make up this workshop, and uh, with such great leadership, uh, we really had a fantastic night tonight. So I wanted to let y'all know about some fun things that are coming up um, close soon and also a little bit in the future. Uh, so on this Sunday, early morning Sunday, 9.30 to 11.30, we're gonna be doing a virtual poetry workshop with Karina Castlebaum. There's still seats available through the library. And if you'd like, I can, um, expect to see you and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions about that. It's going to be really fun and playful and uh, really interesting kind of we're going to be putting ourselves in different kinds of exercises. So this is not your traditional poetry uh, workshop. And if any of you have worked with Karina in the past, you know exactly what I mean. And if you haven't, you're missing out. So please, I'd love to see all of you uh, on Sunday morning in the Zoom room. Uh, we also, of course, have our quiet writing times. We have brought those back to the downtown Bend Library and the Redmond Library every Monday morning and Tuesday morning at the downtown Bend and Redmond, respectively. We have a few hours together that's just a free, quiet, good Wi-Fi spot for all of you to get some good work done. 
uh, bring a book, bring your emails. You do not have to be writing your great American novel, but we will give you the space to do that if you are working on it. So uh, come when you want, leave when you, come when you can, leave when you want. I think that's how Mike says it. And we, uh, I'm there in the rooms. So happy to see you and find all that information at deshootslibrary.org. And then something kind of exciting that we're not even unrolled, we haven't even rolled it out yet. I see all the first ones to know. We are putting together a critique group program for January. So what this will be, it, it'll be a very small, just like a brief snapshot, couple po couple poems, couple pages. Uh, will be kind of similar to tonight's format. You'll be dropped into a Zoom room with strangers, hopefully strangers you already know. And you'll be able to just get some good, honest feedback. And that's the whole purpose. There's no nothing to get through. There's no nothing else. It's just that. So I hope that you all will sign up for that. You can't yet because it's not even live, but as soon as it is, I'll send it to Mike's way and then he'll send it all of your way and we'll make sure that you have space. And this is something that I hope that we can start doing more of because it's really the last final piece of the writing puzzle that we haven't quite addressed yet. So uh, look for more information on that. So get something done so you have something to bring for January. I'm giving you so much time. You're welcome. All right, that's it, everyone. It was so good to see all of you. I hope to see you again soon at the library. And until then, take care. Thanks, everybody.